people coming from completely different uh, backgrounds and uh, different interests uh, to uh, share their views on, on uh, this uh, uh, very uh, unique situation that we are all dealing with. As you said, uh, uh, I will be speaking on something completely different uh, uh, just in, in, as in this uh, phrase of a Monty Python flying circus. So now it's something completely different as to what you just heard, although this was really uh, interesting for me as a lawyer because we do quite a lot uh, uh, on legal reasoning. So it was, uh, it was really interesting to, to listen to, uh, to uh, uh, these topics, uh, this topic. Uh, as you said, uh, my uh, topic of my presentation, uh, or I, I would rather call it uh, an introductory talk because I sincerely uh, hope that there will be um, some discussion or, or your um, uh, also uh, comments uh, uh, on this issue because I think this is something uh, which is of interest uh, for all of us as primarily as, uh, as citizens. Uh, and I put the title Post-Corona World Trading Liberty for Security. And my first uh, caveat is um, of methodological uh, nature. It seems that with uh, the topic uh, titled this way, we are into uh, some business of predictions. Uh, however, uh, as we are all scholars uh, with the uh, academic background, we are not uh, into a mere prophesying, obviously. And uh, when I thought about this approach, um, it took me to the book uh, which was published, uh, hopefully you can see, uh, it's published in 2001. So at the very beginning of this century, it's called Predictions. 30 great minds on the future. So you have a different scientists uh, from different uh, um, disciplines uh, talking and predicting uh, in a way uh, on different issues. So in the introduction to this book, uh, you have the um, a kind of a warning by, by the uh, Jonathan Weiner who wrote the introduction. And he says, and I quote for us, schooled and chastened by the scientific process, the best way to think about the future is not in terms of the magic, sudden knowledge of the diviner, but the slow, hard-won knowledge of the experiment. Uh, of course, relying on experiment in gaining knowledge is a, a trademark mostly of natural sciences and only some of the social sciences, for instance, sociology or at least part of sociology. Uh, I myself uh, am a, a legal philosopher and I'm working mostly in analytical tradition, but I'm not uh, shying away from problems of normative political philosophy as Mirna mentioned, for instance, uh, political philosophy of, of multiculturalism. Um, so the first question, uh, if we want to employ this kind of heuristic framework for this discussion is obviously, can we deem Corona pandemic to be one such uh, scientifically valuable experiment, which can offer some both manifest uh, and underlying insights uh, upon which we can develop then some reliable knowledge for future times. Uh, and my hunch that uh, the answer is positive and that uh, we lived or we are still living in, in a, a rather big experiment uh, in which I'm mostly interested in one part of this uh, experiment. And this is the plausible implications of the global experience of legal and political responses to COVID-19 pandemic crisis for the future of our legal and political world. So uh, in this methodological sense, uh, I would say that what I'm about to say is an 
is a mixed uh, bag of analytical insights, for instance, about the sort of legal and political means for coping with the crisis, uh, which is given, uh, which are given within the uh, certain preferable political philosophical framework, for instance, constitutional democracy as a normative setting. And, uh, and at the same time, uh, these insights um, tend to establish certain uh, causal relations between what we've experienced and what might be learned uh, for the future pattern uh, of behavior of key actors, uh, mostly governments. And in that part, this really resembles some sort of sociological, sociological uh, uh, component of this, of this talk. So let me start with, um, uh, with uh, what I uh, take to be a common thread in a global response to, to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And this is the use of certain exceptional legal and political measures uh, whose main characteristic uh, is that uh, uh, it presupposes the limitation and restriction uh, of our individual rights, of individual human rights, uh, you may put it as well. Uh, and uh, for instance, what we basically all of us experience uh, all around the world uh, is restriction on our uh, freedom of movement in, uh, in a more harsh or in a less uh, harsh manner uh, during this, this crisis. But there were also uh, uh, measures which are far more uh, robust, uh, I may say, for instance, uh, we've all uh, probably read about the so-called cell phone surveillance uh, systems, which were uh, installed uh, across, across the globe in a number of countries. Uh, and these surveillance systems basically uh, were used for the purposes of tracking those who are uh, infected by the uh, by the virus, but uh, in the implementation of this uh, cell phone surveillance systems, uh, at times um, individuals were exposed to those measures without consent. In better scenarios, which also happened in uh, some countries, uh, people voluntarily voluntarily. Uh, consented, acceded uh, to, these, uh, uh, to these programs, to these uh, mostly uh, cell phone apps, which enable uh, governments to track their, uh, uh, to track their uh, movement uh, and to keep them, for instance, in, uh, in a safe zone, uh, in a quarantine zone uh, uh, and not being a, a potential health threat to to other, to other citizens. So uh, these uh, measures, these mechanisms, are uh, obviously something uh, which, is, which was quite new for uh, a number of uh, us as citizens. And uh, at the same time, we can, uh, we can uh, say that, uh, we can speak of these measures as some sort of established, uh, established fact uh, of uh, of this uh, of this previous uh, period, uh, the second thing to be uh, mentioned is that uh, uh, all these responses were taken by the uh, individual states. Um, uh, why am I emphasizing this? Because uh, in a way, we all as citizens were quite aware of the fact that the source of this risk, this global health risk uh, was global in its nature, that it could not be sustained at, uh, or that it could hardly be sustained at the borders on 
any of the state, irrespective of the measures taken by the individual state. And yet, uh, these legal and political measures were uh, taken mostly by the individual states as actors. For instance, we all know that there was uh, quite, uh, um, quite some resistance to, to a number of uh, the attempts made by the global actor, World Health Organization, in uh, managing, the whole, uh, uh, managing the whole situation and uh, states uh, basically individually tailored those measures according to certain local preferences, which obviously I cannot go into detail of each and every situation, but the important thing is that we have this as a pattern all over the uh, uh, globe. Then there is another uh, salient feature uh, of this whole situation uh, is that this type of response was largely met with the public approval. So even those measures which uh, implied the severe restruct uh, restriction of individual freedom was uh, often met with no resistance at all. Uh, we may recollect certain protests, uh, we may recollect certain uh, public rallies, but at the same time, if we think carefully, we can also remember that most of these protests were raised uh, uh, with a very dubious political agenda, with uh, uh, again, mixed justification for this protest, often with some conspiracy theories in mind and so on and so forth. So uh, basically uh, what we had as a almost established fact is that, um, and it, it was confirmed by the comparative public service around the world, is that trust in government uh, globally was at an all time high uh, despite this uh, coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic. Um, and according to, to Edelman Trust uh, uh, Barometer from the spring update, it was up 11 points uh, in January. So 65% uh, of the trust, uh, this was very credible, uh, a poll of uh, uh, more than 13,000 uh, respondents around the world. And we also saw from a number of places like Germany or even Italy. Uh, take Italy as an example with uh, one of the worst uh, 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 cases of the, uh, uh, of the corona crisis. And yet the government was uh, at its high uh, uh, in, the public, in the public polls. And um, it's interesting to notice, especially having in mind the topic of our uh, uh, the conference, uh, the, the, the global topic of the conference, that um, some of those measures that were introduced were justified exactly by uh, the reference to solidarity, or maybe more, more specifically uh, with the uh, um, social responsibility uh, uh, call. So having in mind social responsibility towards the, the elder in society. So if they had to be uh, put somehow in their apartments uh, uh, locked uh, uh, between four uh, walls, we should do the same for some time and so on and so forth. So solidarity was uh, uh, something which also uh, 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 driven a number of people uh, into these experiments with, uh, with uh, uh, cell phone surveillance. They wanted to be uh, a kind of socially responsible and to be uh, uh, available to, to the uh, uh, governmental uh, surveillance in order not to threat the lives of the other members of the community. So we can translate the behavior into the value of solidarity. Uh, so, more or less, these are the, the kind of the, the framework of the, of the entire picture. But now the, the key issue, at least uh, uh, to me, and more debatable issue is that uh, whether the exact risk 
posed by the virus uh, was of such a nature as to justify all those measures. Um, so I'm not here obviously interested, nor I can say anything uh, uh, meaningful from the perspective of, of medicine or virology about the, the whole problem. But uh, I'm interested in political and security uh, aspect. But uh, it's clear that this aspect is crucially dependent on the former, on the former question. And in the absence of a clear scientific answer about the nature of the virus, about its causes, about its uh, overall potential threat to human health, those taking legal and political measures in response to the crisis has obviously an additional maneuvering space to discretionary operate with our fear. Uh, from this sudden and unknown health uh, threat. So if we try to translate uh, this problem in the terminology of the security studies, uh, the, the, the key question is, uh, is what type of security threat we are dealing with. Uh, and I'm here relying on one uh, such uh, uh, study taken by Busan Weaver and De Wilde. And so they speak about security as the move that takes politics beyond the established rules of the game and frame the issue either as a special kind of politics or as above politics. And in theory, any public issue can be located on a continuum, on a spectrum ranging from non-politicized issue completely. So the state does not deal with it in any uh, kind of the sense. It, it does not translate it into a public debate or a, a decision-making issue. Through politicized issue, meaning the issue is a part of the public policy requiring governmental decision and so on and so forth, to securitized issue, uh, meaning the issue, and now this is a quotation, the issue is presented as an existential threat requiring emergency measures and justifying action outside the normal bounds of political procedure. Uh, so from the point of view of uh, these security studies, the placement of certain issue on the continuum is basically open. So depending upon circumstances, any issue can end up on any part of the spectrum. It can be non-politicized at all. And we may think in these terms and we will see that uh, in certain previous times, uh, certain uh, virus uh, uh, epidemic were, uh, were not issue for the political uh, uh, action of any kind to politicized now maybe to over securitized issue that that's the thing i want to uh, kind of uh, um, challenge or to 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 debate with uh, uh, with the rest of the uh, audience uh, obviously uh, this is uh, uh, what we see when we approach from the security uh, uh, point of view but if we uh, approach from the point of view of the given uh, legal or uh, legal order, uh, the things are not so open, the, the things are not so fluid, or at least there are some limitations to the qualification of a certain threat. So as, just as, a, as an example, I read the, uh, one of the provisions of the Serbian constitution, which states, when the survival of the state or its citizens is threatened by a public danger, the National Assembly shall proclaim the state of emergency. So basically here, we have to see uh, whether legally to qualify COVID-19 crisis as a type of public danger threatening the survival of the state or its citizens. If this is the kind of threat, then we shall impose state of emergency, which means obviously limitation of human rights. 
uh, and all other sorts of measures. Uh, so this decision can be, uh, can be filtered through the securi securitization lens uh, insofar as the Serbian legal system, for instance, knows of a milder legal regime, which, call, which is called exceptional circumstances. In this regime, uh, government cannot take so uh, far-reaching measures. It cannot uh, uh, limit some of human rights. It basically it's restricted in a number of in a number of way, uh, ways. But as you can suppose, uh, and some of you know very well, what was introduced was not a legal regime of ex exceptional circumstances, but the legal regime of uh, the state of emergency. So the one which is, uh, which is harsher, which basically, uh, which basically proceed with the view that coronavirus a pandemic was a, a kind of security threat of such a uh, of such a magnitude uh, nature, uh, and this was primarily lawyers' worry. Uh, the rest of citizens they were they were very uh, comfortable with the with the fact that uh, that um, the state of emergency was introduced. And as far as I know, when we had a, a number of, uh, of lectures within our Belgrade Legal Theory a group uh, with people coming from different, professors coming from different countries and speaking about the exceptional regimes taken in, the, in this, um, in this uh, uh, period, uh, the situation was pretty much the same uh, uh, all over. Uh, all over the, the, the world, uh, only lawyers and not all lawyers, maybe uh, constitutional lawyers primarily were uh, very worried about the, the thing. Uh, and uh, now if we try to make some sort of prediction for it based on what we've seen uh, in, the, in the previous period. Uh, I have to say first the securitization obviously has started and I think that we can all agree on that. Securitization has started to be employed more robustly, robustly with the global terrorist attacks. And, uh, and then there were a lot of other issues like global environmental uh, problems, um, uh, also organized crimes more locally uh, and uh, and global global viruses. Not this is not the first time Ebola crisis was also significant to the extent that even uh, UN Security Council had a resolution which uh, which referred to the to the question of Ebola, irrespective of the fact that this is uh, uh, this was uh, unimaginable up to to that point that uh, that Ebola can be. Uh, can be treated as a security threat. And this is the, the key uh, area of the Security Council uh, functioning. So uh, I would say that one of the biggest threats for us is that we as citizens won't be able to provide informed consent on the issues of this sort because A, either scientifically verified knowledge will be lacking and or we will be bombarded with different sorts of information, information, which will often manipulate with our fears. This is basically what we are experiencing also uh, at this moment. And in such a situation uh, of uncertainty, governments will routinely scrutinize, uh, securita secu securitize political issues which will lead to citizens' lower resistance towards restriction of their rights. And um, obviously this process will not happen even handedly in all parts of the world. But I suspect that even the most developed and robust pol political and human rights culture would be vulnerable to the trump card of securitization. And what we experience basically is that securitization started at the places with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, the most developed legal and political culture like USA or 
Great Britain or other uh, constitutional democracies. So in the long run, uh, our daily lives will start to resemble some of the well-known anti-utopian scenarios from the literature. Even nowadays, you know, like wearing masks and gloves and, uh, and being kind of normalized uh, with this, uh, with this uh, outfit in the public uh, uh, sphere is, is kind of uh, resembling scenarios of anti-utopian anti uh, uh, fictional, uh, fictional works. And um, so what might be the uh, comment on this possible future scenario? I will just throw this well-known saying of Benjamin Franklin, even though there are uh, some of the interpretation which says that it was widely misinterpreted throughout the, uh, throughout the years, but nevertheless, uh, his well-known words are those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. And with this, I will leave you for comments, questions, uh, whatever. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mildred, for this very uh, passionate talk which protects what is the most important in life, which is liberty. Uh, well, there are already some questions in the chat, so I think uh, Giselle is the first one who will ask. Giselle, please. Uh, hello. We can hear you, hello. but not see you. Hello. Yes, bon. now it's everything. Tu Bernard? Bon. Tout a... Merci, <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Uh, Vraiment, j'ai écouté avec beaucoup d'attention ce, cet exposé et euh, j'ai retenu euh, notamment euh, la question de, de l'utilisation de la pandémie euh, pour des raisons, euh, pour des motifs politiques. Euh, je, je veux prendre le cas de la Centrafrique où dernièrement, euh, le gouvernement a voulu euh, utiliser le Covid-19, euh, le qualifier comme étant un motif, euh, euh, un motif pas, pas d'exception, mais un motif euh, pour ne pas aller aux élections prochaines, voilà, pour ne pas que les élections se tiennent dans les délais. Et euh, la Cour constitutionnelle euh, a rejeté justement cette demande de modification. Hein. C'était une tentative de modifier la Constitution pour y insérer un motif qui permettrait euh, de ne pas aller maintenant aux élections. Euh, le peuple n'était évidemment pas d'accord euh, et la Cour constitutionnelle a euh, rejeté euh, cette, cette, cette demande-là. Euh, donc, moi, je voudrais savoir, en tant que juriste, euh, quelles sont les marges de... Qu'est-ce qu'il faudrait faire, justement, pour que euh, l'après-Covid, euh, le Covid lui-même, puisqu'on parle encore d'autres vagues qui vont venir, ne soit pas utilisé par certains États euh, pour euh, prendre des décisions qui iraient à l'encontre euh, de la volonté des peuples Okay, I'll translate for those who don't speak French. Uh, Giselle uh, has very much appreciated your intervention and she has uh, retained uh, the, the basic point of you saying that various governments have used the situation to increase their own powers in ways that were perhaps not legal. She mentioned an example from her own country, Central African Republic, in which the government has tried to uh, stop the elections with the excuse that this cannot be done using uh, because of the COVID. And then the, 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 the main court, uh, the Supreme Court of the country, overthrew this decision of the government and the elections will be held. So Giselle would like to know what in your opinion uh, could be done to stop the governments in certain countries abusing the power that the COVID crisis has given them. Uh, thank you, Giselle, for, for the, the, the interesting question. Actually, uh, there was a, some sort of parallel between what you've just said about the situation in Central African Republic and what we've had in, uh, in Serbia, because uh, when I mentioned that there was a, a kind of option between the two models, 
one which was uh, uh, less harsh for the uh, for the restriction of human rights, the, the regime of exceptional circumstances, and the state of emergency. The decision was partly, uh, partly triggered by the fact that the elections were uh, uh, scheduled for the, um, in the period, in the coming days uh, ahead of the, of the uh, COVID-19 crisis. So the only way to postpone the scheduled election was basically to introduce this harsher model of state of emergency. And this was a main motivation for the, uh, for the government to go ahead for this, for this model. Uh, so what, is, what are our, so to say, res uh, resources, us as a citizens, uh, probably this would this will not uh, sound very um, helpful or promising or optimistic, but by the end of the day, uh, there is no better way to defend our rights but the whole arsenal of our legal and political culture. Simply to know when our rights are threatened, when our rights are endangered, and when to defend them uh, in, in a sort of a, a robust way. Uh, sometimes uh, the nature of the, of the threat is so, uh, so to say, it's very convenient for the government to go with this very uh, uh, um, far reaching measures. And this is exactly the case of a virus because it's spreading very easily from one person to, to another. And this 